In this lecture, I'll talk about the big data problem, the hardware for big data, how we distribute work, how we handle failures and slow machines, how we can use MapReduce to handle complex jobs, and Apache Spark. Some of the traditional analysis tools that we use include Unix shell commands, Pandas, and R. One of the things that all of these tools have in common is they all run on a single machine. The big data problem means that data is growing faster than computation speeds. We have many different sources of data, and those sources of data are growing. Web, mobile, scientific. Storage is getting cheaper. This means people are saving more data. And the size of storage is doubling every 18 months, so we can save even more data. But CPUs are not increasing in speed, and we have many storage bottlenecks getting data in and out of this massive storage. Some examples of big data include Facebook's daily logs. They're 60 terabytes in size. Every day, they collect 60 terabytes worth of data. The Thousand Genomes Project has 200 terabytes of human genome data. Google's web index is estimated to be larger than 10 petabytes of data. Now, driving all of this is the fact that storage has really dropped in cost. A one terabyte disk is only $35, but it can take three hours to read the data from the disk or write it to the disk. The big data problem means that a single machine can no longer process or even hold all of the data that we want to analyze. The only solution we have is to distribute the data over large clusters. Here's an example of a large cluster, one of Google's data center that contains tens of thousands of machines. How do we program this thing? The hardware we have for big data includes lots of hard drives and CPUs. The question is, how do we organize these CPUs and hard drives? One approach is to put them all in one big box. This is a solution that people used in the 1990s. But it was very expensive because these machines were only produced in very low volume, and they were considered premium hardware. And for today's big data, these machines are not big enough. The alternative that we use for big data today is consumer-grade hardware. It's not the gold-plated servers that we put traditionally into data centers, but rather it's more desktop-like ki kinds of machines. These machines are very to e easy to add in terms of capacity. They're much cheaper per, for an individual CPU and disk than traditional servers but they're not as reliable and they're much harder to manage. The trade-off is we'll deal with this complexity in software instead. So some of the problems that we have with cheap hardware include failures. So Google's numbers are that you lose between one to 5% of hard drives every year and 0.2% of memory chips per year. Also, network speeds are much slower than the shared memory speeds that we found in those big box 1990s solutions. It's much slower to read something over the network, and the network can be much slower than reading something from a storage drive. Also, these machines have very uneven performance. Some may be very fast, others may be very slow, sometimes because they're failing. So what's hard about cluster computing? Well, one challenge is how do we split work across machines? Let's look at an example. How do we count the number of occurrences of each word in a document? So here we have the document, I am Sam, I am Sam, Sam I am, do you like green eggs and ham? We'd like to count the words. So for example, there are three occurrences of I, three occurrences of am, three occurrences of Sam, and one of do, and one of you, and one of like, and so on. So one approach we could do is to use a hash table. So here, we start with an empty hash table, and we look at each word. So we start with i. i doesn't appear in the hash table, so we add it with a single occurrence. We then examine the word am. Am does not occur in the hash table, so we add it with one occurrence. We look at sam. Sam occurs not at all in our hash table, so we add sam to our hash table with one occurrence. Now we see i, that appears in our hash table already, and so we update the value to two. And we can keep doing this for each of the words in our document. 
what if we have a really large document? Well, one approach is to take that document and to split it up into different partitions. We can then process those partitions individually using the same approach that we just used on a single machine for a small document. So here we have four machines and we've taken our document and divided it up into four partitions. Each mach machine only computes the word occurrence for that dot machine's partition of the document. And then once we're done, on the fifth machine, we combine all of the results. But what's the problem with this type of approach if we have a really large document? Well, the problem is all of the results have to fit in one machine. So now machine five has to be really, really large if we have a really, really large document that we start with that has lots and lots of words. So that's not a good approach. Another alternative you might think of doing would be to try and add layers of aggregation. So machines one and two combine their results and machines three and four combine the results. But ultimately, all of the results still have to fit on one machine. So this approach won't work either for a really, really large document. Instead, we could use divide and conquer. So we're going to take our document, partition it, and process it individually on machines one through four. And then all of the machines will send their value for their counts for I to one machine, and their counts for do to one machine, and so on. And we can do this for all of the words, partition everything across the machines. And in fact, these could be the same machines, one through four, that we used already. Now, our result is also partitioned across multiple machines. This first step of counting all of the words is a map. Combining all of those results is a reduce. And this is what Google wrote about in 2004 in a research paper. We can use MapReduce also for sorting. So here, the reduce step, we partition across the different machines based upon the number of occurrences. This allows us to ask, answer questions such as, what word is used most? So for the first machine, we send all of the words that occur two or fewer times. To the second machine, we send all of the words that occur more than two times, but four or fewer times. We send to the third machine all of the words that occur more than four times, but fewer than five, five or fewer times. And to the fourth machine, we send all of the words that occur more than five times. Now, what makes cloud computing difficult? Well, there are two challenges we have to deal with. The first is how do we divide work across machines? We have to consider our network, how it's organized, how fast it is or how slow it is. And we have to consider where data is located, data locality, because moving data may be very expensive especially if we have a lot of data that has to be moved. The second thing that makes cluster computing difficult is dealing with failures. If a server fails on average every three years, with 10,000 nodes in our cluster, we'll see 10 faults per day. But an even more difficult problem to deal with is stragglers, nodes that have not failed, but are just running very slowly. Maybe they're about to fail, or they have some other problem, and that's causing them to perform very slowly. That's much more common than failures uh, from a node completely failing. How do we deal with failures? So in this case, the first machine has failed. The simplest solution is to just launch another task, either on that machine if it's recovered, or on another machine. How do we deal with slow tasks? So in this case, all of the other tasks finish quickly, but the task that was running on machine one hasn't finished yet. All we do is just simply launch another task and then kill that original task. And we can launch that task on a different machine because maybe that first machine was about to fail and so it's running very slowly. With distributed execution in MapReduce, each stage that we perform passes through the hard drives. So the initial step of the map reads data from the hard drive, processes it, and then writes it out to disk before we perform the shuffle operation to send data to the reducers. At the reducers, they read the data in from disk, process it, and write the results out to disk. 
As a result, if we have an iterative job, so here a job that has three stages and we're just repeating that, so we do stage one, stage two, stage three, then repeat stage one again, then there will be a lot of disk I.O. operations for each repetition. You can see this in the figure above the stage one, stage two, stage three diagram. Each of those mappers is reading in data from disk, then writing data to disk, only to be read back again from disk by the reducers, written to disk by that reducer, then read again by the next stage's uh, mapper, and so on. The problem here is that disk I.O. is very slow. So if we're running iterative jobs, they're primarily going to run at the speed of the disks instead of the speed of our CPUs. This is a motivation for Apache Spark because it's not just iterative jobs that we want to perform when we're doing data science, but also complex jobs like interactive mining or stream processing or interactive queries. In each one of these cases, we start with some source data and we repeatedly read that data and perform calculations and write data back out to disk. That high amount of disk I.O. means things are going to run very slowly because, again, disk I.O. is very slow. Technology trends show that the cost of memory is dropping. Here's a graph that shows the cost of memory with, on the x-axis, the year, and on the y-axis, price. And this is a log linear plot. And so you can see that memory is dropping exponentially over time. In 2010, it only cost one cent per megabyte. Now, what does this mean? Cheaper memory means we can put a lot more memory in each server. So now the hardware that we have for big data is lots of hard drives, lots of CPUs, and lots of memory. So this gives us an opportunity. We can keep more data in memory instead of writing it out to slow disks and then having to read it right back in from those slow disks. So this opportunity led to the creation of a new distributed execution engine, Apache Spark. So we'd like to use memory instead of disk. Remember that what happens when we have an iterative task is we read in data from disk, process it, write it out to disk, read it in for the next iteration, process it, write it back to disk, and so on. Similarly, when we're performing a query, we read information from disk, perform that query job to give a result, and then for the next query that comes in, we read the data back in all over again and present a result. And if we're operating interactively, this is going to be very, very slow. So instead, what we'd like to do is use memory and use memory for in-data sharing. So here, when we read in from disk for iteration one, when we're finished, we write it to memory. And that way, iteration two can read from very fast memory and write to very fast memory. And the same thing with our query. We do a one-time processing step to read our data into distributed memory, and from there, all of the queries run from memory. This can be anywhere from 10 to 100 times faster than using the network or the disk. The abstraction that Apache Spark provides is that of the Resilient Distributed Data Sets, or RDDs. We write our programs in terms of operations on distributed data sets, and these are partition collections of objects that are spread across a cluster stored either in memory or on disk. We can manipulate and build RDDs using a diverse set of parallel transformations, including map, filter, and join, and actions, including count, collect, and save. And Spark automatically keeps track of how we created the RDDs and will automatically rebuild them if a machine fails or a job is running slowly. The Spark Computing Framework provides programming abstractions and a parallel runtime that hides the complexities of fault tolerance and slow machines. Basically, all a programmer has to do is say, here's an operation, run it on all of the data. They don't have to worry about where it runs, that's handled by Spark, and they don't have to worry about slow nodes or failed nodes. Spark will automatically run it multiple times and guarantee the correct result. Now, the Spark framework actually consists of four components. There's the core of Apache Spark component, along with Spark SQL, Spark Streaming, the ML Machine Learning Library, and the Graphics Graphical Computing Library. Let's talk about the differences between Spark and MapReduce. 
In MapReduce, your only option for storage is the disk. In Spark, it supports both in-memory storage and on-disk storage. In terms of operations, MapReduce only supports the map and reduce operations, whereas Spark supports map, reduce, join, sample, and many other operations. The execution model for MapReduce is limited to batch, whereas for Spark, Spark supports execution models including batch, interactive, and streaming. In terms of programming environments, MapReduce only supports the Java environment, whereas Spark supports Scala, Java, R, and Python. Other differences between Spark and MapReduce include Spark having, the, having support for generalized patterns. It has a unified engine that supports many different kinds of programming use cases. Spark also supports lazy evaluation of the lineage graph, which leads to reduced wait states and better pipelining. Spark also has lower overhead for starting jobs and less expensive shuffles. Pulling all of this together, in-memory operation makes a huge difference in terms of overall performance. Here are, here's a comparison of two different iterative machine learning algorithms, k-means clustering and logistic regression. On the x-axis, we have the runtime of these algorithms for the different environments in seconds. Let's start with k-means clustering. In red, we have Hadoop MapReduce, and you can see it takes 121 seconds to complete that ma machine learning algorithm, whereas Spark takes 4.1 seconds. For logistic regression, it takes MapReduce 80 seconds to complete the execution, whereas Spark completes execution in less than a second. Here are results from the Daytona Gray 100 terabyte sort benchmark. Spark set the record for the sort benchmark in fall of 2014 by reducing the time it took to perform that benchmark from Hadoop, which held the, the record previously at 72 minutes, down to 23 minutes. There's no actual benchmark for it, but Spark demonstrated the sort of one petabyte, that's a thousand terabytes worth of data, that took only 234 minutes running on 190 Amazon EC2 instances. A different way of looking at the difference between Spark and other tools is this survey, which shows the median salaries for respondents who use a, a given tool. This is a survey that covered over 100 respondents around the globe, and it showed that Spark expertise led to higher salaries for respondents. Now, there's just a correlation here, but that does obviously not mean causation. However, it's an interesting observation to see.